Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 36, The Irish Influences in Late Antiquity. Ireland is so close to Wales in geography and ancestry. The intercommunal trading and relationships were developed across the Irish Sea over thousands of years. Few could argue with the influence of Ireland on Wales. And the same could be said in reverse. The Western and Northern Welsh were genetically some of the oldest in the British Isles, so they had spent many years in isolation from the rest of Britain, while still receiving influence from their neighbor to the West. As mentioned many episodes ago, the Irish may have had influence in the Iron Age tribes around Llyn. Even after the Roman period, this link appears to have remained. The Irish raided the length of the British West from Carlisle to Cardiff. The Romans in the 3rd century tried to strengthen forts in the Severn Estuary, and they also built new ones like Cardiff, showing that they were facing increasing problems by sea. By the middle of the 4th century, invaders known as the Scotti and Atacotti, according to the sources, joined with the Picts and other barbarian raiders to defeat the local legions in Roman Britain. From 360 to 367 AD, Irish raiders created confusion, rebellion, and then were eventually relocated by the Romans themselves to help fight other tribes in the German wars. Poets on both sides of the Irish Sea talk of how the Irish invaded Britain, the Romans praising themselves for killing the raiders, the Irish celebrating bringing booty and loot home to their clans. The riches of Britain were cattle, slaves, and precious metal, all of which would have been good supply up and down the coast. At some point, things began to change from warfare to settlement. The Irish names, much like the Welsh names, I will have some trouble with, so be prepared for some mangling of these words, but I'll do my best. Uh, the Desi moved from Munster to Leinster, in the southern Ireland to Dyfed, and the Irish sagas and even Welsh manuscripts attest to this particular situation. And even the archaeology itself tells us that there was some sense of migration from Ireland to Wales, especially in the Dyfed area. Ogham inscriptions are a form of scripts derived from Latin and early Brythonic, are found in the south and southwest of Ireland and all over southwest Wales. It is estimated that the Desi migrated around the late 4th century, likely around the time of the Atticate were being brought into the Roman fold as hired soldiers. Some academics think that the Irish, they were Irish second-class citizens that were brought in to take the place of Roman troops in these settled areas on the coast and also to guard against Irish sea raiding. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned is the idea that the, the word Atticate is actually an Irish word and that it means uh, those who are second-class citizens or lower-born. And so maybe these were people trying to seek their fortune elsewhere who may have gotten caught up in the raiding and the, and the, the problems that were going on in the middle of the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. And they may be the people that we're talking about here. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean necessarily that they were the raiders that were taking part in the problems that they were having for the Roman Britons, but rather that they were either of the same tribe or at least the same circumstance. And in the old-fashioned ways of the late Roman antiquity, they were brought on board to act as mercenaries or as higher guard, effectively. And it would make sense, if you look around the edge of the Severn Estuary, it makes perfect sense to have them there, because that is a key point of ships moving into the estuary. If you can have people who have seafaring capability, have military capability to act as your defense force, as your, you know, uh, coast guard, effectively, they would sit there and be able to patrol quite easily and get back and forward and be able to see the approaches quite well. And so anybody approaching that area would obviously be picked up unless it was particularly foggy or rainy or something along that line which would probably make the Irish Sea quite treacherous, I would suspect. So, in that respect, it makes perfect sense that they would do this. And it is pretty much the MO of the Roman, especially the late Roman period, to do those kind of things. So, the sources are likely correct in what happened, and the inscriptions certainly show that there was respect given for the Roman ideals. Um, 
The Ogham inscriptions, in fact, continue to appear all along the coast of Western Britain, from the highlands of Scotland to Demonia in the south, which is in Cornwall and Devon. Professor Cunliffe posits the idea that these Irish settlers and their name, Desi, is likely a derivative of that Akkadi. He's actually the one who, who I was saying earlier kind of pushed this forward. This would mean that the former raiders were then hired to protect the Irish Sea against more raids. Irish settlers respected the Roman ways enough to continue them after they left the country. One of the leaders of this new group was by inscription called Votabrix, which is very intriguing because it refers to their status as his name, long associated with Gildas, means Refuge King. However, there is a slight translation correction which some argue in that it also could mean a, a title which was given in late antiquity as as a honorary one, which is the title protector, referring specifically to protector of the emperor. Now, this was generally given to Roman aristocrats and nobles who would then be in the, and effectively the emperor's court and would be his protector. Well, in this case, that had long since gone out of style by late antiquity. And so instead, it was given to sort of honored people who are protecting the emperor's lands, for lack of a better phrase. The fact that he would have this in his name, is this a title? Is it a name? It's hard to say. And, but what it does show is, regardless, that likely they were continuing to honor the Romans that had gone before them, and the Roman Britain ideals had actually remained important enough that they remembered it in this name. So even if this person isn't necessarily an original ancestor or original settler, he may be someone who received that name because of the honorific uh, surrounding it. It shows that they were still stressing the Roman ancestry and the Roman ideals that they came to, to agree on. And this is interesting because if they're doing that with Roman ideals, they will also continue to do that with the ideals that come afterwards. In fact, these particular Irish will settle into the, the Welsh kingdom and almost become indistinguishable as far as the culture and their way of thinking and their language will eventually merge into the greater Welsh language. And we will end up having them be indistinguishable from the rest of the Welsh people. So if they saw themselves as a continuation of the Roman Empire rather than an Irish invasion, it might explain why they merged as quickly as they did into the Welsh culture without much of a speed bump, and why these richer areas of South Wales might welcome them instead of fear them. You have to remember, this is an area that we've talked about before, where it was generally a pretty nice area to live in. It had been settled since the Stone Ages, and had always been sort of a place where humans existed and continued to use, to farm. It was very attractive in that respect. So, plus it had access to the coast. So there was fishing and all those kind of things. So it was an attractive location. So, of course, it would be an easy and, and welcome and inviting place to raid. So it is interesting to see how easily they settled in with the, the rest of the Welsh population that was there. Um, and as these Desai were settling in South Wales, it was possible, at least according to some academics, that in the north, the Scotty were entering the Thleen in Peninsula area. Uh, in the sources, it is viewed as an invasion rather than a settlement. The legend, and I have to say this is legendary, but the legend goes that a Scottish-British king in uh, an area we've talked about before, which is Cadotton, named Cunetha, has was called in to help defend the northern Welsh against these Irish invaders. He comes down, and the story goes, he and his sons and his tribe come down on mass and defend them and then he's asked to be king and so he becomes the the ancestral king of Gwyneth now it's a very interesting idea but this foundation and this idea of Gwyneth being established by this man has a lot of problems attached to it and we're going to get into some in a few minutes here he was purported to have driven them out like not just the fact that he beat the Irish in battle, but that he actually drove them out. And so this foundation is built on the idea that the, that the British came down and took over, took back the kingdom away from, from the Irish. 
Some academics contend that the name Gwyneth actually in itself has Irish roots, and that settlers from Ireland continued to live in the land that was considered part of what had been the Ordovice in the years prior. A monument stone, in fact, is found in Caragidion, which claims that uh, Corbalungius lies here, an Ordovician. So, again, it shows that continuity, at least even into the late antiquity, of the Ordovice in our area of North Wales. So, these West Coast Welshmen, who still considered themselves a member of that tribe, would then not necessarily be Irish, they would probably be British. However, shortly after this period, which was the late 4th, early 5th century, this also happens to be the last mention of the tribe. The Ordovice don't continue after this. There's no mention of them beyond this point, either in inscriptions or in the source material, for that matter. And shortly after, Gwyneth is now the predominant name for Northwest Wales. Historian Charles Edwards felt that the name Llyn likely originates from the name for an Irish tribe, which in the 5th century was being pressured by other local tribes and may have fled to Wales to escape that collision, uh, and they come from Leinster. Those links with Leinster are also seen in the name of a community founded on the coast called uh, Dinhlein, or the Fortress of Llanin, the Fortress of Lenin, Lengen, the Fortress of Lengen, However, Charles Edwards also suggests that the name Gwyneth is one linked more closely to the rivals of the Lestermen, called the Fenai. These Fenai defeated and conquered the areas of the southeast coast and central parts of Ireland, giving them access to the Irish Sea. Around about 500 AD, it is argued that they began to migrate across to Wales. So in other words, before this, they had no access to the coast. They then got into conflict with Leinster and other places, and then took over the coast, and in the process, it then opened them up to the trade and the movement of people across the Irish Sea. So again, this would have been a very healthy trade for them, so they probably would have moved people and troops and all sorts of things across the sea for various reasons. Uh, it may be at that time that Llyn and the surrounding areas were part of a greater Irish kingdom, so the advent of the Fenai seems both likely and easy to understand if the ruling families were aligned. In other words, the ruling families in Gwyneth were aligned with the ones in Leicester, or in Leinster, and then got aligned with the Fene after the fact because, well, you know where your political bread is buttered. Uh, it may be that they held an alliance with the Fene, which allowed them to consolidate power in the area of North Wales. Certainly, trade would have been important to both sides, and being able to traverse the, and being able to uh, traverse the Irish Sea and being a well-known spot for trouble from raiders and slavers and all these things, it would have been important to both sides to be protected from that. So you can imagine, as Gwyneth becomes less of a petty kingdom and more of a real, honest-to-goodness, straightforward uh, monarchy in the area, the power that they would have and their ability to put their stamp in the area of water that they're traveling in a time when, as I said, especially in northern England and Scotland, there was a lot more raids and slave-taking and all sorts of things that went on. Famously, of course, at this point, St. Patrick is captured and enslaved in Ireland. All of these kind of things are starting to happen around then or had been happening for a very long time in some cases. So that alliance with a powerful Irish tribe would be important for Gwyneth. So regardless of whether or not they were family-related or if there were Irish people in North Wales who actually had taken it over, that kingdom's alliance with the Fene would make perfect sense, and it would be important to them. However, if this accommodation and settlement is true, then Nennius and his claims about Cunetha are mistaken or fictional to give Gwyneth the solid Roman-British rooting. Considering that as much of the early part of the book is justifying a Roman connection for the establishment of Britain in the first place through Brutus, based in the Aeonid as opposed to actual fact, uh, that would make one suspect and expect that there was myth-making going on and that it was an important political tool for establishing the British bona fides. Again, we're going back to the idea that the history of Britain, as written by, in quotes, Nennius, is a political document as much as it is a so-called historical document. It is a foundation story built on the concept of justifying the current king of Gwyneth. 
And so we have to evaluate and be skeptical because of that. And I can will consistently stress this, and I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but it is something we need to be aware of. Because if we understand that, then it'll make it much easier to be able to deal with the outcome of that and what comes later when we actually get into more historically well-known situations in the later part of the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. The other thing this kind of points to and, and does lead to question is it does seem kind of like the current king is is protesting a little too much, a little worried about trying to convince everybody else that his claim on the throne was strong. I mean, how better to show up Doithbarth and Powys and the other petty kingdoms of Wales than to say you were founded by a well-known and well-extinct British kingdom. It is a time-honored tradition, in fact, in myth-making. Quite honestly, we do this all the time. I can actually point to a point in my, as a personal example in my uh, wife's family history where they were linked to a princess of Wales who had died in a nunnery and very much did not have children. And so the concept that they would actually be descended from her is, of course, not true. But at some point down the line, somebody thought it was important to show that link to monarchy. Thus, they used a name they knew, but actually didn't understand really a whole lot about. And I know that there was, within the European monarchies, a tendency to use extinct kingdoms, like the Welsh kingdoms, as an example, because harder to prove, right? It, it's one of those things where you can say what you want because nobody can really be sure. Thus, the reason why this slips into our modern family trees. And so I could definitely see why this would be happening and why Gwyneth would see this as important. But it doesn't escape us from the fact that the Irish were an important part of the Welsh foundations. The Irish nationals that came into North and South and West Wales, they build our understanding of what was going on in that point. And, and something that I've thought about since I started writing this script is that what this shows us is that the Western part of Britain, and especially the Welsh, weren't really concerned with the Saxons at this point, particularly if they weren't near the border. Gwyneth and Daffod are not worried about what's going on in the middle part of the country and what's going on in the eastern part of the country. Roman Britain and the former provinces weren't really important to them, but the migration, settlement, and alliances with the Irish were of very much importance, were right in the here and now for them in the early part of the 5th and 6th centuries. They were basically the way that they could deal with the current problems. And we know for a fact that the Irish were a major part of the problem for the Roman British, so their successors in Wales would still look at them as being the gist of the issue. Because, of course, the Welsh weren't invaded by Picts. They didn't really get hit by Romans until several years after the Romans had settled. They weren't really, you know, high up on, on the takeover tour of a lot of people just because of the difficulty of getting into the terrain. And because of that advantage, that layer of mountains that lies between Wales and England, especially West Wales, it gives them a layer of protection that they may not have had. But the coastline is a whole other factor. So, of course, the Irish will take precedence and those things will take precedence. And it won't be until later, when we get into the later part of, of the, the first millennia, that we start to see that turn around and the focus changes from being at Ireland to England. And that comes about because, of course, these small little kingdoms of Gwyneth and Duffid, who become much bigger and much more influential in Wales, also become much more influential in all of Britain. And they suddenly have a lot more clout, a lot more military power, and they look to try and enforce that military power by keeping either the English out or trying to nail down alliances or knuckle under their local kingdom allies and or enemies. They will, from time to time, make alliances with the Saxons to fight other Saxons or even other Welsh tribes and kingdoms. Uh, Powys and Gwyneth will go back and forward, making alliances with Mercia, for example, and fight 
other Saxon members of the Heptarchy, or they'll fight each other. And so we'll see this fairly consistently across Welsh history until the late Middle Ages, where these kingdoms are as much fighting each other as they are fighting the Saxons, fighting the Irish, fighting any invaders, because they're so busy trying to become the predominant kingdom. And this will continually bite them in the butt, to be perfectly frank. And in fact, at the end of the day, the reason why Wales fell to the English is because of this infighting, because none of the the kingdoms could really work together well. And so it was very difficult for them to get that unity. And the fact that England unified much quicker probably was why Wales fell, unlike Scotland, and likely why the Welsh struggled to try and maintain independence in the face of the English. More so than even the population and the finances, I think the lack of unity is shown. And this is part of the reason why, is I think they have very mixed ideas about what's important and when and how to help. And Gildas will get into more of this in, in, in his calls to repentance for the various Welsh kings. He will definitely be pointing out some of their inconsistencies, their willingness to fight each other as much as the enemy, and their unwillingness to actually do what, they're, what they should be doing. And that's something that we are going to get into. Uh, the other thing we're going to get into in the next little while is we're going to start to talk about life for a peasant. We're not going to get too far into it, because especially in the early Middle Ages, late antiquity, we don't have a lot of good archaeological evidence in Wales. We do have a little bit, and we can kind of talk about it from a general perspective, especially if we bring in other areas where we have much better archaeology. We can kind of give an overlay of kind of what life would have been like kind of things that they would do. So I want to try and do some of that more as we go, because, of course, we've, we've done a lot of, you know, mile-high versions of history where we're talking about great big concepts or great big, you know, major events, but we haven't really gone down to the local level, and I'd like to do a bit more of that. So we definitely will as we go through this process, but we're only just at the tipping point of that particular discussion. But we will get into that a little bit, like I said. And we'll talk about how life changes for your average person in, in the end of Roman Britain and the beginning, especially of the early Welsh kingdoms, and what life would have been about at that point and how they would have been able to function and work together and how communities and kingdoms were made. As well, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the tyrants of Gildas and get into, in a future discussion, some of these kings, who we think they are, who they might be, who they might not be, and what they mean for us as far as looking at them from a historical standpoint. Uh, I hope you all have a good day. I hope you're enjoying your listening. I appreciate all of our listeners, and I am especially happy to see so many international listeners. I really hope you're enjoying this and, and look forward to feedback from anyone. If you'd like to, to send me a message of any type, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can reach me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And you can reach me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. Or if you just want to talk about general things and stuff not necessarily related to Welsh history, I'm also on Twitter at John DMP. You can find everything we're doing at distractionsmedia.com. I would encourage you to check some of those things out. We're doing a lot of Twitch streaming these days. And uh, I know on my channel, we've been doing a lot of fun things. And you can actually find that at twitch.tv forward slash Linstead DM. And until next time, everyone, have a great day. And we'll see you later. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.